Okay, good morning again to everybody. Today we will uh, uh, apply more or less uh, all the theory we have covered so far in the previous three weeks of this course uh, to a specific uh, um, electromagnetic problem, which is a classical one, the so-called Sommerfeld half space problem. Uh, this is the configuration that we will address. The problem consists in finding the electromagnetic, the magnetic potential produced by a vertical electric dipole, the ED, which is placed in a vacuum in the presence of a lossy dielectric half space, of a dielectric half space that, which can be generally lossy, so it is represented through a relative permittivity, epsilon r, which is generally a complex number. We will work in a time harmonic regime with this kind of implicit time dependence, the usual one, e to j omega t, where omega is the radian frequency. And as you can see in the picture, there is this vertical electric dipole represented by a blue arrow, a vertical arrow, which is located at some vertical abscissa, z prime, along the z axis. The amplitude of this uh, source is p0 which is expressed in amperes times meter. Analytically, this kind of source can be represented as an impressed electric current, uh, which is proportional to delta Dirac delta functions, since this is a point source, so it is non-zero only where the source is located, that is when z is equal to z prime, and when rho, the transverse vector, position vector, is the, the zero vector, so you can see here the product of two deltas. Then there is the unit vector z, which gives us the direction of the dipole. And finally, the complex amplitude, p0. Note that the source is in a vacuum, so the wave number k1 of the medium below the interface, that is below the plane z equals zero, is equal to the vacuum wave number, k0, so the ratio between omega and the free space velocity, c. Whereas in the dielectric, the wave number, k2, is given by k1 times the relative permittivity of the medium, which again is in general, in general lossy. Just a moment, let me see if, could you please, uh, let me see what you're writing. Could you please show the slides? Yes, sorry, I forgot to enlarge them. Okay, now they are in full screen. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, <clears throat> now this is the problem, and uh, let us uh, look first at the incident uh, potential. That is the potential that would exist in the absence of the upper half space, and therefore we will consider now a vertical electric dipole in a, a full vacuum. Okay, the entire three-dimensional space. Now, this is, a, of course, a canonical well-known problem uh, which can be solved in a closed form. We know that the field produced by such a source is a purely TM field, which could be uh, inferred, for example, from reciprocity. And as such, it can be obtained uh, by means of a purely vertically directed magnetic potential. That is, the magnetic potential AI note the superscript i, which stands for incident, that is directed along the z-axis. The only non-zero component of this potential is known in a closed form and is given by the well-known free space Green's function, that is a spherical wave, e to minus j k1 r divided by 4 pi r. Please, please, come in. The free space Green's function is, of course, weighted by the complex amplitude of the source. Okay, so for the sake of uh, Clementina, who has just come in, we are considering here the problem of a vertical dipole in the presence of a dielectric half space. This kind of configuration is known as the Sommerfeld half space problem, and this is the topic of this lesson. This will give us the the chance of applying many of the concepts we have introduced in general. So I was considering first the incident potential, which is available in a closed form, 
through the free space grids function note that r capital r is the distance between the source and the general observation point p and so it is the square root of rho squared plus c minus z prime squared okay this is Okay, this is the, the incident potential. Now, this incident potential must interact with the upper half space, so with the planar interface. And unfortunately, since this is a spherical wave, its interaction with the planar interface cannot be de described in a closed form. What we are able to do in a closed form is to uh, describe the interaction of plane waves with planar boundaries through the usual Fresnel coefficients. Okay, so one thing we can do is to represent this spherical wave as a superposition of plane waves. That is, we need the so-called plane wave spectrum of this uh, spherical wave. Now, uh, there is a useful identity, which we will not derive, but the derivation is not so difficult, the so-called Weyl identity, which uh, gives us precisely what we need, that is, uh, it is a representation of the free space uh, scalar Green's function on the left hand side in terms of a two dimensional Fourier spectrum that is an inverse two dimensional inverse Fourier transform and therefore uh, a plane wave spectrum representation in which as you can see uh, the amplitude of the general component of this plane wave spectrum is given by the factor one over 2j kz1, where kz1 is the vertical uh, wave number uh, in, uh, in the medium number one, that is in this case in vacuum, which by the separability condition is linked to the transverse wave vector kt as the square root of k1 squared minus kt dot kt. Since we need to take a square root, which is a two-valued function, we need also to make a choice among the uh, between the two determinations of this uh, square root function and the choice we will do is consistent with the fact that uh, the evanescent waves of the spectrum uh, must decay at infinity so if you observe the field far from the interface any of the, the evanescent waves contained in this uh, two-dimensional spectrum must decay at plus and minus infinity this can be enforced by requiring that the imaginary part of the vertical wave number kz1 be less than zero because in, in this case uh, this exponential here in, in this fraction it becomes uh, an exponential that decays at infinity in both directions away from from the source okay okay once we have this representation then we can make any elementary uh, plane wave in this spectrum interact uh, with the planar interface. And the interaction is described through the well-known reflection coefficient. That is, in this case, the TM reflection coefficient. That is, we are dealing with the so-called vertical polarization. Uh, so any elementary plane wave in this spectrum is represented in this picture here below through its... Uh, um, phase vector beta incident and then there is uh, its uh, uh, magnetic field which is transverse to the z-axis and the electric field which is contained uh, in the incident plane which is uh, represented here with a gray dashed lines what happens is uh, well known there, there will be a reflected wave and also a transmitted wave the reflected wave uh, is weighted in amplitude by this tm reflection coefficient which can be derived, for example, through an equivalent transmission line. Its expression is very simple. It's a ratio of the difference and the sum of the two characteristic impedances of the transmission lines associated with TM waves, which are available in closed form. They are, in turn, the ratio between the vertical wave number and the, the product of the radian frequency omega and the permittivity of the medium just a moment okay hello Mayer. and and note that uh, uh, is mediated by the vertical wave numbers 
uh, these vertical wave numbers uh, uh, do not depend on the plane on the incident plane so even though in principle this reflection coefficient could depend both on the the angle theta capital theta and on the angle capital phi that defines the incident plane however there is no dependence on phi actually because uh, uh, these these um, reflection coefficient depends only on the absolute value of the transverse wave vector that is on the angle theta which is the incident angle okay furthermore as you know if you uh, in, have a plane wave a tm plane wave that is incident on a planar interface both the reflected and the transmitted waves will be again tm plane waves so there is no cross polarization um, that is because we are considering an isotropic medium, of course. So uh, the problem is quite simple. Uh, we, we just need a scalar reflection coefficient, which depends uh, again on the, only on k rho, which is the absolute value of the transverse wave vector. Okay. This is the way to describe the interaction of any elementary wave with our interface. So now thanks to the VAR identity, we can reconstruct the entire field. For example, the reflected potential will be given by the same integral as in the VAR identity. However, we have to include the reflection coefficient, gamma tm. Note that we will do that by also including a minus sign. And this is because uh, you may uh, recall that uh, when you associate a transmission, an equivalent transmission line to any modal field and if plane waves are the modes of free space uh, you, you can do that by sorting out uh, quantities that are called voltages and currents and typically uh, the, vo the equivalent voltage is associated with a factor in the expression of the transverse electric field whereas the current the equivalent current is uh, associated with some factor in the expression of the transverse magnetic field now, it turns out that uh, um, the, the vertical component, AZ, of the magnetic potential, which is proportional through L, the, the factorized dependence on Z, uh, now this L is proportional in turn to the current. So, what we need to include inside this integral representation is the current reflection coefficient rather than the voltage reflection coefficient. And since gamma TM is a voltage reflection coefficient, what we need is to change its sign because as you know, as you may recall from transmission line theory, the current reflection coefficient is the opposite of the voltage reflection coefficient, okay? Now, having said that, we have an integral representation for the reflected potential. So now we can calculate the total potential at the interface by summing the incident and the reflected potential. So the total potential at the lower, the electric vacuum, the electric interface, that is on the plane z equals zero minus, is given by an integral which contains now the factor one minus gamma, where the constant one is associated with the incident field and minus gamma is associated with the reflected field. Okay. Note that we are observing things at z equals zero. So now the, this, this first exponential contains only the dependence on z prime, that is the distance, the, the, the location of the source. Now, since uh, we have continuity of the tangential components of both the electric and magnetic fields, uh, we have in turn continuity of the equivalent voltages and currents, and therefore in turn we have the continuity of AZ at the interface. Now, this tells us that AZ on the lower interface is equal to AZ on the upper interface. So we can dispose the superscript minus or plus and, and simply write AZ evaluated at the interface. Now, once we know AZ at the interface, uh, the transmitted potential, that is the potential inside the dielectric, can be evaluated simply by including the propagation term inside the dielectric that is the exponential e to minus j k z two z divided by two j k z two, which is the one dimensional Green's function inside the dielectric. Okay, where k z two is now the vertical wave number inside 
medium number two that is inside the dielectric, which is linked to the transverse wave vector KT by the uh, standard separability condition. So we have the square root of K2 squared minus KT dot KT. And again, in order to enforce the the field that the, the potential and hence the field decays at infinity, we need to choose the determination of this square root um, such that the imaginary part of the vertical wave number is less than zero. Okay. So uh, we can now collect everything we have said so far. We now know the potential. We have an expression for the potential everywhere. In particular, in the lower uh, vacuum half space, we have the sum of the incident potential, which is available in closed form. So it's the free space this function, plus an integral representation of the reflected potential, where you can see the reflection coefficient. Whereas in the upper dielectric half space, we have another a different integral representation in terms of the vertical wave number KZ2. Okay, this is uh, uh, a complete representation for the potential. However, we can uh, make some simplification before starting with our manipulations. And the simplification takes into account that this problem has uh, a strong symmetry in its geometry, that is, uh, an azimuthal symmetry. The entire configuration is rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. And this symmetry, of course, must be uh, exploited in order to simplify things as much as possible. Uh, how can we do that? Well, note that uh, all the expressions we have derived for the reflected and for the transmitted potential have the same general form. They are inverse two-dimensional Fourier transforms. Okay. So of this kind, uh, of the integral i, of the general integral i that you can see here above. Now we can change variables from Cart Cartesian to polar, and we will do that both in the spectral domain. So we introduce the polar spectral variables k rho that we have already introduced, and capital phi, which is the, the spectral angle. And we will also change variables uh, in the space domain so for, from the to the standard polar coordinates rho and phi small phi if we do that uh, uh, inside the general in two-dimensional inverse Fourier transform note that uh, uh, the differential becomes k rho times d k rho d phi now the, the dot product in the, in the exponent of the exponential can be written as uh, k rho rho times the cosine of the difference between the two angles, the spectral angle and the special, spatial angle phi. The, the two-dimensional integration is now done in uh, polar coordinates uh, and we can reverse the order of integrations. So we perform first the angular integration inside and this can be done in closed form. And it turns out that uh, the polar integration gives us a, a term which is proportional to the Bessel function of order zero with argument k rho times rho. Note that uh, in uh, stating this result, we have lost the dependence on phi, on small phi. This expresses the fact that our configuration is rotationally invariant around around the z-axis. So if you collect uh, all the pieces together, you discover that our integral i is a, a function of the radial variable rho only, and that it can be cast in the form, in this standard form, which is called the Sommerfeld integral. The name of Sommerfeld will appear many times in this lesson. Uh, there is also a, a standard notation S sub zero. This is a Sommerfeld integral of order zero because it involves uh, the Bessel function of order zero. There could also be high order Sommerfeld integrals, but we will not find them in our problem because of its rotational symmetry. This is what is also known as an inverse Fourier Bessel transform of order zero, or equivalently, an inverse Hankel transform of order zero. All these uh, names indicate the same thing. So if we exploit this in our representation for the potential, 
what we get is this more compact representation in which instead of having two-dimensional spectral integrals in the Fourier space, in the Cartesian Fourier space, we have just one-dimensional inverse Hankel transform integrals in terms of the radial spectral variable k rho. Inside those integrals, however, we find the Bessel function, which is not so good news because on one hand, the Bessel function is a very regular function. It is an entire function uh, of its argument. However, it oscillates. And so we need to deal with generally infinite range uh, integrals with oscillating integrands. But we will address uh, the study of the integrands in more detail uh, in a few slides. What, what we have obtained so far is the so-called axial transmission representation of the potential. That is because if you consider the elementary wave that is contained inside uh, these integrals, what you see is a wave uh, that propagates along the vertical z-axis through this exponential here, which represents a traveling wave form of a wave, whereas the um, Bessel function, as you may recall from the study, for example, of circular waveguides, represents a standing wave form of a wave in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so for this this reason, uh, this is known as the axial transmission representation of the potential. We will see in this lesson that this is not the only possible representation, and is not even the most convenient representation, both for analytical purposes and uh, for numerical evaluation. However, this form uh, makes it evident the rotational symmetry of, of the structure because it is clear that there is no dependence on phi. So the only dependencies are on rho, the radial coordinate, and on z, the vertical coordinate. Okay, this is our starting point. Let me drink. Okay, the point is, of course, that we are not able to evaluate in a closed form these integrals. So we cannot express analytically the solution to the Sommerfeld half space problem. So in front of us, we have two possibilities either evaluate numerically these integrals or manipulate them analytically and try maybe to find some asymptotic expansion for them. In, in, for both purposes, what we need to know very accurately is the properties in terms of singularities in the complex plane uh, of the integrands, which is what we will now address. Uh, now, the Bessel function, as I mentioned before, is an entire function of its argument. So no singularities may arise because of the Bessel functions. The singularities uh, arise instead from the reflection coefficient gamma, because this is in the form of a rational function of the vertical wave numbers. So there is a denominator. And if this denominator uh, be equal to, were equal to zero, then we would have poles in our function, that is pole singularities. So this is one source, one possible source of singularities. But in addition, since there are vertical wave numbers, uh, those vertical wave numbers are expressed, uh, as we already mentioned, by square root functions. And uh, square root functions are multi-valued functions, actually two-valued functions. So therefore, they will introduce branch points with the associated branch cuts. In particular, let us consider the latter point. Uh, since we have two square roots, uh, we have four possible choices in, in uh, total because we can have two determinations of either of the two square roots. So this means that uh, there, there will be two pairs of branch points. One pair is uh, at plus minus k1 and this is associated with the square root that defines the vertical wave number in the lower medium that is vacuum in our problem. And the second pair of branch points is at plus minus k2 and this is um, originated from the square root that defines the vertical wave numbers in the upper medium, that is inside the dielectric. And in fact, we can write these also as plus minus K1 times the square root of epsilon R. 
In addition, we, we have to choose uh, pairs of two pairs of branch cuts in, in uh, correspondence with those branch points. So in total, our integrand will be a function that is the uh, surface, which has four sheets. Each of those four sheets corresponds to one possible choice for the values of those double signs, plus or my, sorry, not these double signs, but the, the one of the two determinations of those two square root functions. So for example, we can number those Riemann sheets with uh, Roman numerals from one to four. In the first Riemann sheet, by definition, uh, which is of course an arbitrary definition, we have that the choice of the square root is such that the imaginary part of both is less than zero. Now, this Riemann sheet number one is connected by a branch cut to the Riemann sheet number two, where instead the vertical wave number KZ1 has imaginary part, part positive instead of negative, whereas KZ2 uh, remains with a negative imaginary part. So if you go downstairs through this cut, you, you land on the red line, which is, represents here the Riemann sheet, where KZ1 has a positive imaginary part. And from this second sheet, you could also exploit another branch cut associated with KZ2 in order to change sign also to the second wave number, KZ2, thus uh, going downstairs, let's say here in, in the cellar, we are now in the fourth Riemann sheet where both wave numbers have a positive imaginary part. From here, you can take the elevator to the, the floor number three, where now the imaginary part of KZ1 is less than zero, whereas the imaginary part of KZ2 is larger than zero. And if you wish, you can uh, go back on the ceiling, where again, you are now through the, this fourth branch cut uh, to the starting point. Okay, so this is more or less the topology of the four sheets. Now, let us see more explicitly the shape of the one of the possible one possible choice for the shape of the branch cuts. The typical choice for the branch cuts is that uh, which comes from uh, the condition that the imaginary part of the wave number KZ1 or KZ2 be equal to zero, because that choice separates the sheets uh, that we have defined so far. And as we uh, already calculated actually in our very first lesson of this course, the shape of the branch cuts is hyperbolic. So you can see, for example, in this complex plane, the four branch points, K1, minus K1, K2, and minus K2. And since both media have been for a moment assumed to be lossy, those four numbers are complex, so they are not real. And if you consider uh, the hyperbolas, uh, the equilateral hyperbolas that go through those branch points, you have the wiggly lines that define the so-called Sommerfeld branch cuts. If you now remove losses from medium one, which could, for example, be vacuum, what you get is that K1 becomes a real number. So the, those two hyperbolas in light red, degenerate into segments or infinite lines. There are finite segments along the horizontal axis and infinite half lines along the vertical positive and negative imaginary axis. Okay. Whereas uh, since medium two stays lossy, the wave numbers K2 belong to the fourth and second quadrant. And therefore you can see the hyperbolic shape of the result in the associated branch cut. Okay. Keep in mind that every time you cross any of those branch cuts, this means that you are changing floor. So you are going to a different Riemann sheet, okay? The topology being that the one that was described in the previous slide. Okay, having said that, let us turn our, our attention to the pole singularities, which are known again as Sommerfeld poles. Those can be obtained by equating to zero the denominator of the reflection coefficient. And if you do that, what you get is a 
by definition a dispersion equation, a modal dispersion equation. This is uh, always true if you consider the polar singularities of the spectral Green's functions. Those will give you the wave numbers of the modes supported by your structure. In this case, the dispersion equation has this shape in the box. It's an equality between two square root functions. On the left, you have the square root of k1 squared minus k rho squared, and this is multiplied by epsilon r, whereas the relative permittivity is contained inside the square root on the right hand side, where you can see there is epsilon r k1 squared minus k rho squared. And in addition, there is a minus sign in front of the square root on the right hand side. Now, if it is immediate to solve analytically this in the unknown, which is k rho, that is the wave number, because you just need to square both sides and rearrange in order to find k rho. In order to find k rho, you have to take a square root, so you have double determination for k rho, the expression being the one here given in red. Those are the so-called Sommerfeld poles. The expression is plus minus k1 times the square root of the ratio between epsilon r and epsilon r plus 1. This kind of solution uh, indicates uh, uh, two numbers in the complex plane, and we are interested in uh, observing where those numbers, that is, where those poles are located. Now, to, to find the precise location, Consider uh, the complex plane depicted here and imagine that epsilon r, which is generally complex, uh, is uh, somewhere here in the fourth quadrant. Why in the fourth quadrant? Well, because we will assume to deal with some lossy passive medium for which the imaginary part will be less than zero. Okay, So epsilon r will be somewhere there and uh, therefore we can define this angle phi with respect to the positive real axis. Now, if you shift by one on the right, epsilon r, you will uh, reach the point epsilon r plus one, and this defines an angle psi, which is, of course, less than phi by the geometry, okay? Now, this is useful because if you now try to write the expression of the Sommerfeld poles, in particular, the one with the positive sign in front, uh, in polar form, what you get is k1, which is a positive real number because the medium one uh, is vacuum. Then there is the square root of the absolute values of epsilon r and epsilon r plus one. And then we collect in a single exponential all the phase terms uh, and we have e2 minus j phi over two, which comes from the square root of the numerator and e2 plus j psi over 2, which comes from the square root of the denominator, okay? Now, in this form, it should be evident that the overall phase, which is phi, phi minus psi over 2, is, uh, in, together with the minus sign, a negative quantity, and therefore, the Sommerfeld pole resides in the fourth quadrant of the complex plane. Of course, it's opposite, that is the one with the minus sign in front uh, will instead reside on the second in the second quadrant. So we have a pair of poles, one in the fourth and one in the second quadrant of the complex plane. However, our integrand was defined as a single valued function on a four sheeted Riemann surface. So we have four copies of the complex plane and the point is to understand these poles to which of those four complex planes belong. Now, unfortunately, when you square the left and right hand sides of the dispersion equation, you get exactly this information. You, 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 you lose this information, sorry, because by squaring, you obliterate any distinction between the square root branches, because by squaring, any uh, information on the sign is lost. So we have to do a specific analysis on this point. Now, if you take the solution for the Sommerfeld pole, which is now have been obtained, and you uh, replace it inside the dispersion equation, what you get is this kind of equality between a left and a right hand side. 
Now, if you assume that the, the medium two is more lossy than medium one, as is typical, for example, if medium one is vacuum, it's a lossless medium, whereas medium two could be soil, for example. Um, so that we, we may write the, the wave number K1 squared as uh, in polar form as the absolute value of K1 squared times E2 minus J delta and delta be a positive angle less than psi, which is the loss angle of medium two. Okay, if we assume that, so then if you consider the left hand side of the above equation, and in particular the square root at the left hand side, you can write that square root in polar form as you can see here, where there is this uh, exponential which collects all the phases e to j psi minus delta divided by two. Since this, this uh, phase is a positive quantity, we have introduced a minus sign in order to choose uh, the determination with the negative imaginary part of the left hand side. Now, if we do the, uh, the same thing on the right hand side of the dispersion equation, that is, again, we choose the determination with the negative imaginary part, what you discover is that the left and right hand sides match. So basically, the dispersion equation is satisfied by the Sommerfeld poles, provided that you consistently choose the negative imaginary parts of both square roots. This means that the Sommerfeld poles belong to sheet number one, which was the sheet, the so-called top sheet, as in this drawing, because it's drawn on top, where both vertical wave numbers have a negative imaginary part. On the other hand, by the form of the dispersion equation, if you do the opposite choice, so you consistently evaluate the square roots by choosing the positive instead of the negative imaginary part, this means that you simultaneously switch the sign of both sides of this equation, which is therefore again satisfied. So if instead of choosing the negative imaginary parts, you choose the, the positive imaginary parts, again, the Sommerfeld poles will satisfy the dispersion equation. This means that those are poles also in the fourth, fourth sheet, that is here at the bottom. So we have a pair of poles, both in the top and in the bottom-est Riemann sheet, okay? On the other hand, those poles are absent in the second and third Riemann sheets, because on those sheets, the dispersion equation is not satisfied, because you would not match, in that case, the signs of the left and of the right hand sides. However, note that the reflection coefficient, let me find it again here, has this structure in which the sign of the denominator occurring in the denominator is the opposite than the sign occurring in the numerator. So the difference between numerator and denominator is only a matter of sign. So this means that uh, if you now in the dispersion equation evaluate, uh, say, the left square root by choosing the negative imaginary part and the right square root by choosing the positive imaginary part, what you will satisfy is not the dispersion equation, that is, you will not find the zero of the denominator, but rather you will find the zero of the numerator of the reflection coefficient. And this is true, uh, therefore, in uh, the Riemann sheets number two and number three. So we can say that the Sommerfeld poles are also zeros, simultaneously are zeros, in the Riemann sheets number two and number three. Now, since when the reflection coefficient is zero, what we get is the so-called Brewster phenomenon. So there is no reflected wave, but only a transmitted wave. For this reason, we will say that those are Brewster zeros. So overall, the picture is that we have two pairs of poles in the fourth and first quadrants, and two pairs of Brewster zeros on the second and on the third Riemann sheets. Okay, this is the kind of singularities and zeros that originate from the reflection coefficient gamma.
Okay, having said that, uh, our integral runs along the real, positive real axis of the complex k rho plane. So now here I have collected all the information we, we know so far. We have the branch points, and for clarity, I have drawn k1 as a complex number, so I, I am assuming some losses also in medium number one with the associated hyperbolic Sommerfeld branch cuts uh, represented as weekly lines. Then there is a, a pair of poles, uh, and what I'm representing here is the top Riemann sheet, that is the Riemann sheet number one, where there is a pair of Sommerfeld poles, Kp and minus Kp. And then we need to integrate along the so-called Sommerfeld integration path that runs from the origin to plus infinity along the positive real axis of this complex plane. Note that the location of the poles, which is given analytically by this expression, is such that if the, there is a high contrast, a high dielectric contrast between the two media, that is, in the limit when the absolute value of the relative permittivity becomes very large, and this ratio tends to 1, and therefore the, comp, the, the Sommerfeld pole will tend to K1, that is, will become very, very close to the branch point at K1. This, of course, is very inconvenient because this causes a spike in the integrand, that is because K1 actually is very close to the real axis or even on the real axis if we neglect losses in medium number one. So what we get is that in addition to being an infinite range integral, and in addition to having an oscillating character in the integrand because of the Bessel function, we also have a spike due to the closeness of this pole singularity. Okay, so there is a sort of collection of pathologies in this kind of uh, Sommerfeld integrals, which, by the way, constitute an entire chapter in, inside computational electromagnetics. So there are, there are people who have devoted their existence to the evaluation of Sommerfeld integrals. Okay, so there is a huge literature about the evaluation, also from a purely numerical point of view. This is just to give you uh, an idea of the kind of shape of the spike that you would find if you choose some numerical typical parameters, like the one given, the ones given here which could represent a lossy ground, for example, at one megahertz. So we are dealing with radio frequencies. What you get is if you plot the absolute value in a logarithmic scale, so note that the vertical axis is logarithmic. And if you plot the integrand uh, along the, the real axis of the complex k rho plane, which is the bottom plane here, where you can see also the ISO modulus lines. Here is the shape of the function that you need to integrate with this huge peak, which is due to the closeness of the Sommerfeld pole, which is at the center of this uh, sort of vortex here, to the branch point, which is located at k rho equal k1. In this normalized scale, the branch point would be located at 1 in abscissa sign 0 in ordinate because we are normalizing here the axis with respect to k1. So the branch point is on the real axis at the point of abscissa 1. And uh, okay, so this is a nasty function to integrate. Uh, by the way, this picture and many of the things uh, I'm saying today to you are taken from this beautiful work by Mikalski and Mosig, who are two giants in numerical electromagnetics and who have written a series of papers about this, the classical Sommerfeld half space problem. Now, in order to avoid the spike, one thing that is typically done numerically to, to, to try to address numerically the evaluation of Sommerfeld integrals is to detour the integration path away from the real axis, which is admissible thanks to the Cauchy theorem. Uh, you could, for example, choose this kind of path in which you first uh, 
move in, in some oblique direction up to a point k1 plus j delta where delta is a well chosen displacement vertical displacement from the real axis then you go back to the real axis through a second oblique segment and then there is the so-called sommerfeld tail that is the, the infinite range, range integral that occurs on the real axis from some place beyond k1 and plus infinity the vertical displacement delta must be chosen judiciously that is if you make it too large you will discover that the Bessel function will have huge oscillations because the Bessel function with a, a complex argument will oscillate with uh, wildly uh, large oscillations if the imaginary part of the argument is too large so you should not displace the, the path too much from the real axis but uh, the minimum that is enough to avoid the, that big spike that i showed you okay so once you do that you can use standard quadrature rules to integrate on the uh, oblique segments and once you are on the infinite tail there is a bunch of numerical integration techniques well suited to, to the um, treatment of infinite range oscillatory integrals. As I said to you, there is a, a literature about the integral tails. <laughs> now, another thing that one can do is to try to find alternative representations for the potential. But um, since it's 10 minutes to 11, I think this is a, a good idea. There is a, a good time to make a break. So let's stop here before addressing those integral representations. And uh, let us make a 50 minutes break. So let's come back here at five minutes after 11. Okay. So see you later. <laughs>
Okay, here I am again. Let me enlarge the screen. Okay. Let us now consider some alternative representation for, for the potential, which can be useful for having a more effective numerical evaluation of the integrals, but also in order to provide some physical insight into the kind of waves that are involved. In order to obtain some of these alternative representations, what we will do is to deform the integration path. But preliminarily, one useful thing is to extend the Sommerfeld integration path into a path along the wool real axis. Uh, remind that the Sommerfeld integration path originally runs from the origin throughout the, um, the entire positive real axis. We wish to extend this to the entire real axis, to its also so including the negative part of the real axis. To do that, the standard way uh, is to, <coughs> sorry, is to re <coughs> represent the Bessel function, J0, in terms of the Hunkel function, or better, the Hunkel functions, H0 of the first and of the second kind, in particular, J0 is the half sum of those two Hunkel functions. Now, you, we can also exploit the connection formulas. That is, if you evaluate the Hunkel function of the first kind on the negative real axis, what you get is the negative of the Hunkel function over the two evaluated on the positive real axis. <laughs> so, if you exploit those formulas, we get uh, a representation. <laughs> of the potential in terms of integrals that now run from minus infinity or infinity times e to minus j pi to plus infinity along the, uh, the real axis of the complex k raw plane. So this is the, the, the so-called extended Sommerfeld integration path in addition to the branch points, branch cuts and pole singularities already described. Uh, I have also included this blue wiggly line that is uh, a branch cut, an additional branch cut associated with the branch point at the origin that is introduced by the Hunkel functions. Because the Hunkel functions, differently from the Bessel functions, are not entire functions in the complex plane, but they are multivalued functions. They have a logarithmic singularity with a branch point, a logarithmic branch point at the origin. So therefore, we need to introduce branch cuts. The standard way to do that is to choose a branch cut along the negative real axis. And the extended integration path, Sommerfeld integration path, now runs uh, on the lower rim of this uh, additional branch cut. Note that uh, this branch point and branch cut uh, have no physical meaning. That is, they are associated with our representation of the Bessel function in terms of Hunker functions, but they do not tell us anything in terms of waves involved in the, this phenomenon. Another observation is that these alternative representation in which we have extended the integration path cannot be used to calculate the potential on the vertical z-axis, that is, on points where rho is equal to zero. That is because the argument of the Hunkel functions is proportional to rho, and uh, the Hunkel function diverges <coughs> when its argument goes to zero with the logarithmic divergence. So we cannot let rho go all the way down to zero. So we need to maintain rho strictly positive. Okay. So this this is a useful representation because now if we have uh, an integral integration path along the entire real axis, what we can do is to deform the integration contour. And in particular, we can close the path at infinity through a half circular contour, which, however, must not cross the branch cuts, the Sommerfeld branch cuts. In order to avoid crossing them, we, what we need to do is to detour around the branch cuts. So we, we need to perform this kind of indentations around the branch cuts. Now, because of the asymptotic behavior of the Hunkel function that we derived uh, the last week, uh, at infinity, the Hunkel function in the lower half plane decays exponentially, so the contribution of the half circle at infinity is negligible. And what we get uh, is in the end uh, that the, 
the, our original integral along the, the real axis can be equivalently represented in terms of the integrals around the branch cuts plus the contribution of the pole singularity, which is the contribution of the residue at the Sommerfeld pole here, which is contained inside this closer contour. And so therefore we may apply the residue theorem. So using the residue theorem, what we, we obtain is that our potential, which was originally expressed as an integral along uh, the, the real axis in black, is given by sum of two contributions, two integral contributions uh, around the branch cuts, Q1 and Q2, okay, those integrals in orange, branch cut integrals, plus in blue, the residue contribution of the Sommerfeld pole, which derives from this uh, integral around a small circle around the pole, okay. Now, note that in this uh, uh, representation, the integrands now contain the Hankel functions, which have a traveling wave character instead of a standing wave character in the radial direction. And for this reason, this kind of alternative representation is called a radial transmission representation, as opposed to the axial transmission representation from which we started. Now, the radial transmission representation is also called the spectral representation because it exhibits the, the overall potential as a sum of contribution which have a modal character. In particular, the integrals around the branch cuts provide the continu a continuous spectrum of modes, and that is typical anytime you deform the integration contour uh, to evaluate uh, the contribution of a spectral Green's function around the branch cut, what you get uh, is a, a continuous spectrum of modes, whereas the single discrete residue contributions that come from the pole singularities, those are associated with what is called uh, uh, the discrete spectrum of modes. In this case, the discrete spectrum consists of a single mode because we have a single Sommerfeld pole, and the associated mode or wave is uh, known as the Zennek surface wave. This is from the name of Jan Zennek, who in the, at the beginning of the last century studied uh, the problem of the interface between two different media and discovered uh, the existence of this solution. If you employ the residue theorem, you can find easily the potential associated with this Zennek surface wave, that potential would be uh, proportional uh, through the residue uh, at the Sommerfeld pole to the Hankel function evaluated at Kp rho, where Kp is the Sommerfeld pole. The dependence on the vertical direction uh, coordinate z is given by simple exponentials, e to plus or minus j kz1 or kz2 pz depending on the medium you are considering. So since this pole resides on the top she, Riemann sheet where the imaginary part of the wave numbers is negative, uh, in absolute value the field will decay away from the interface both along the vertical positive direction and along the vertical negative direction. So the shape will be that of a plasmonic wave that is a wave bound to the interface that propagates along the interface as a, a surface wave with uh, circular wave fronts or better cylindrical wave fronts and whose absolute value decays when you go farther and farther from the interface itself okay the radial dependence is uh, described by the hankel function h02 now it's interesting also to note as we mentioned before that since the Sommerfeld pole is also a zero of the reflection coefficient, uh, it may be used uh, to define a complex, generally complex Brewster angle, theta b, by means of the standard formula kp equal k1 times the sine of theta b, which allows you to find the value of this angle, of this Brewster angle, theta b, from the, ex the expression of the Sommerfeld pole you find that the Brewster angle is the inverse sine of the square root of epsilon r divided by epsilon r plus one 
which is the same as the inverse tangent of the square root of epsilon r and here in this form you may recognize the standard form for the Brewster angle okay now note that at the Brewster angle by definition there is no reflected wave so you only have the incident and transmitted waves and both waves decay in magnitude however since the incident wave uh, propagates towards the interface uh, what you get is that the incident wave must be a wave that increases exponentially along its direction of propagation so the imaginary part of the associated wave number must be larger than zero whereas for the transmitted wave the opposite is true so the imaginary part of the wave, wave number must be less than zero so the sign of the two imaginary parts uh, is different and we are neither in the top first Riemann sheet nor in the bottomest fourth Riemann sheet but we are instead in the intermediate sheets second and third one where in fact uh, the signs of the, the imaginary parts of the vertical wave numbers uh, is uh, different okay we could be here on the second or here on the third Riemann sheet which corresponds to the Brewster angles for incidents from either the upper half space or the lower half space okay this is just to reconnect uh, these zeros with the usual Brewster angles that are known from elementary uh, the elementary analysis of fields okay if we now observe the branch cut integrals uh, those branch cut integrals which run uh, along the two rims of, of the branch cuts can be written by changing variable instead of using k raw we can use kz and we will use kz1 in one case and kz2 in the other case and we can also integrate from zero to infinity by folding the, the integrand that is in, in introducing this difference between the integrand on the two rims of the branch cut and we will indicate this difference with this double uh, square bracket here um, now these kind of integrals uh, can in principle be evaluated however since the Sommerfeld pole are still close to the integration path in particular the one associated with the lower wave number there will be there will still be a spike so numerically they they must be treated carefully and in addition the integrand still oscillates because of the Hankel function so to improve things further what we can do is to further deform the integration contour and the deformation the, 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 the most convenient deformation is to the steepest descent path that runs through the, the relevant saddle point now to illustrate let us consider for instance the reflected potential that is the, the potential in the lower half space you can see here the reflection coefficient consider that the source is at z prime we can also introduce uh, the geometric uh, image source at minus z prime and uh, if you connect the, so the image source with the observation point uh, what you get is by definition capital r this distance and we can also define the angle theta here as in this figure so that rho is equal to capital r times the sine of theta whereas minus z plus z prime which is a positive quantity is equal to r times the cosine of theta the angle theta goes from zero to pi over two okay now we wish to evaluate this integral that expresses the reflected potential asymptotically in the limit when uh, the observation distance is very large in particular the, the large quantity is the product k1 times r which is a dimensional of course because it's a product of the of a wave number and a distance if this is a number much larger than one we can try to evaluate this with some asymptotic technique and we will use the Stevens descent technique in order to do that we have to prepare our integral in order to uh, to have a canonical form 
Well, one th first thing that we can do is to scale the Hankel function so that it tends to one in its scaled version when the argument tends to infinity. This means that we have sorted out uh, the blue parts that represent the asymptotic form of the Hankel function that, as we now know from the previous lessons, goes to infinity as an exponential function divided by a square root function. So we have taken inside the integral the parts that depend on the integration variable, k rho, which are in blue, an exponential divided by a square root function. And we have taken outside of the integral the constants. Okay. Of course, the, the purple scaled uh, Hankel function represented with this uh, script font here contains exactly the same factor, uh, but reciprocated, okay, in order to maintain the same integral, the original integral uh, without changes. Now, in this form, in this modified form, we have a canonical integral i of the large parameter k1r that occurs uh, in the exponents of the exponentials. If you collect the two exponentials, the black and the blue one in a single exponential, you can make a single exponential in the form e to k1 r times a certain function phi of the integration variable, where phi is given here at the bottom right of this slide. And all the remaining factors can be collected inside this function f, which is instead defined at the bottom left of this slide. Okay, so once you have the canonical form in the box, so you can apply the standard steepest descent evaluation to this canonical form. And in order to do that, first of all, you need to determine if and which saddle points uh, occur. In this case, it's easy to see that there is a single saddle point because if you evaluate the first derivative of the function phi and you equate it to zero, you will discover that there is a subtle point at plus or minus k1 sine of theta. So there is a subtle point on the real axis, since k1 is a real number, or a lossless lower medium. And this is a first order subtle point because the second derivative of the function phi evaluated at that subtle point is different from zero. And in particular, it is a complex number <coughs> that is purely imaginary. And positive so that the argument of this second derivative uh, is equal to pi over 2. Now this, this subtle point uh, determines the so-called geometrical optics approximation to the reflected potential. Why? Well because basically it selects uh, among the infinite plane waves that constitute the spectrum of the reflected potential those plane waves that correspond to the subtle point wave number that is exactly the plane waves that correspond to the geometrical incident and reflected rays that is the reflected ray that propagates along the angle theta that occurs inside the expression of the subtle point and in fact let us observe uh, precisely the evaluation we need to determine the steepest descent directions uh, with the standard formulas which gives us pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. So starting from the subtle point here in purple, we have these two small arrows that indicate the directions of steepest descent from the subtle point. And the shape of the steepest descent path is the one represented here in gray, where the arrows indicate the direction of descent from the subtle point. So note that the steepest descent path crosses the Sommerfeld branch cuts associated with the K1 branch points. So part of this steepest descent path is represented in dashed line because it actually goes in a different Riemann sheet, the Riemann sheet number two, where the imaginary part of the vertical wave number in the vacuum is positive instead of being negative. Okay. Now, the function that multiplies the exponential in the integrand is regular in the vicinity of the subtle point, so we just need to evaluate this function at the subtle point, and you get a bunch of constants here. As concerns the function phi in the exponent, we will approximate that with the second order polynomial, because we deal with the first order subtle point. 
we evaluate the Jacobian at the origin of the new integration variable s equals zero, and we get this constant here. And finally, we apply the standard evaluation in which we take out of the integral the function f and the Jacobian evaluated at the subtle points. And what remains inside the integral is a Gaussian integral. So if you perform all the algebra, which is skipped here, but is very instructive to do, you will finally discover this very nice and compact result uh, by which to the dominant asymptotic order, the reflected potential is given by a spherical wave that emanates from the image source, so from the point minus z prime, and this is the term uh, having the form of the free space Green's function. So that would be this is a wave that would propagate uh, in uh, a uniform medium that fills the entire space, having the property of the lower medium. So you can see k1 here in this exponential. Even if the source, the image source, uh, is located inside the dielectric, and however, the presence of the dielectric is taken into account by this scaling factor, which is actually the current reflection coefficient that depends on the incident angle to the subtle point uh, wave number. Okay, so what we get is a spherical wave weighted by the reflection coefficient. <laughs> this expresses the dominant asymptotic contribution that is the geometrical optics contribution to the reflected potential. Now, consider that depending on the angle theta that defines of observation, the integral along the steepest descent path that is performed along this gray contour may or may not be the only contribution to the reflected potential. For example, in this picture here, that would be the only contribution. However, if you increase theta, that is, you let the subtle point be closer and closer to the K1 branch point, what you get is that the steepest descent path becomes narrower and narrower, and eventually it will sweep across the second branch point, K2. Since we we, we cannot uh, sweep across a branch point, because in that case we, we would not be able to apply Cauchy theorem, what we need to do is to detour around the branch point, K2, so we will need to introduce an additional integral along the steepest descent path, which is vertical, that goes through the K2 wave number. So, in addition to the integral along the gray steepest descent path, we will also have the contribution of this green contour, which is a second steepest descent path. This latter contribution is by definition what is known as the lateral wave. And in the next lesson, we will see more precisely what this lateral wave means in physical terms. Note that I have distinguished uh, with different kind of styles of the lines uh, the, the position of these integration paths in the different Riemann sheets. So in this case, you can distinguish between the sheet number one, sheet number two, and sheet number three until the extreme situation in which you observe things uh, when theta is equal to pi over two. So at grazing observation along the interface, in which both the steepest descent path number one and number two are vertical folded paths, okay? And in this case, they lie partly on each of the fourth Riemann sheets, okay? Now, these are, of course, the most convenient paths for numerical evaluation. That is because by definition, the integrand decays uh, most rapidly along them since they are steepest descent paths. And so therefore, uh, you don't need to integrate very far from the branch points because the integrand decays exponentially if you go farther and farther from the branch points along those paths. It is possible that if the Sommerfeld pole lies to the right of the K1 branch point, it is captured in this deformation of the integration contour and therefore it will give us an additional residue contribution. So we have two contributions arising from the, the integrals along the steepest descent contours. And there is in blue here, the discrete contribution of the Sommerfeld pole. 
Okay. However, this poll is not always captured. For example, if you have a loss medium with an imaginary with a real part of the permittivity larger than minus three over four, you are in the case uh, studied by Zennek, and you have the so-called Zennek wave, which is which corresponds to a poll which is not captured, and we call this uh, the Sommerfeld case. Whereas, conversely, if the medium is uh, very low loss uh, and if epsilon prime is larger than 3 over 4, also in this case, the pole is not captured and we will call it a Brewster mode. Conversely, in a highly lossy medium uh, with a real part of the permittivity less than minus 3 over 4, so we must have a medium with a negative real part of the permittivity, like it, like it, it could occur in a metal at optical frequencies because as you may know metals can be represented as lossy dielectrics at uh, very high frequencies that is beyond their plasma frequency with a negative real part of the permittivity in this case the pole would be captured so it would lie here like in this picture on the right of the branch point k1 and it would give rise to the so-called surface plasmon polariton which is a kind of surface wave that propagates along the interface of metals. And therefore, we will call this a plasmonic case. There is also a fourth possibility in which the pole is again captured, but the medium is very low lossy, and that case could be classified. Tomerfeld pole, however, depending on the kind of involved media, we can call it in a different wave. So uh, basically the Zennek wave is exactly the same kind of wave uh, as the surface plasmon, surface plasmon polariton wave. Okay, They simply refer to different kind of media. In one case, the pole is not captured for the Zennek wave. In the plasmonic case, it is captured. Okay, But being captured or not, in any case, the pole is close to the branch point. So it, it is important to take it into account. And in particular, the, the role of uh, the Zennek wave uh, or surface plasma polariton wave, in addition to being possibly explicit, uh, as in the plasmonic case, because we see a residue contribution, in any case, the, the, the presence of this Sommerfeld pole will affect the numerical evaluation of the steepest descent uh, of the integrals along the steepest descent path. Okay, so we cannot neglect it. And uh, in particular, if you make the standard change of variables in which you reduce uh, the integrals to the standard form of uh, that you can see here, so you you collect inside the function capital F the folded integrands, and uh, you re reduce the exponential function to this form e to minus s squared times rho. What you get is in the complex plane of the new integration variable S, an integral that now runs along the real axis. And uh, I guess that this lower integration limit should actually be minus infinite. That should be a typo. So the integral runs along the blue contour here. The original contour was the black one. And the pole, the Sommerfeld pole, could be either captured in the plasmonic case in which it is in between the old and new path or it could not be captured as in the Sommerfeld case in which it is here below and therefore it give you no explicit residue contribution in both cases however the pole will be close to the origin which is the saddle point and therefore we need to explicitly deal with its presence and the right way to do that is to extract from the integrand a function that contains the pole singularity. This extraction regularizes the integrand. That is, once you uh, uh, add to the original function f this term here, what you obtain in brackets is now a, a regular function. That is a function that is not the Sommerfeld pole anymore. And therefore, you can deal with this new integral with the standard asymptotic techniques. Let us call this contribution 
i sub p that's a regularized integrand however you must of course uh, subtract what you have added otherwise you would change the value of the integral and what you need to subtract is uh, a function that contains the full singularity however this function is now in a canonical form and it can be manipulated analytically as we will now see in a moment so what we need to do and this is the standard treatment of all singularities in the asymptotic analysis is to add and resubtract uh, a suitable term so that the modified integral ip is now more amenable to be numerically evaluated because now the integral is well behaved it, it does not not oscillate anymore it decays exponentially and it does so faster and faster for larger value of rho so uh, if you uh, have the observation point that is very far from the source the situation is numerically even more favorable because the integral will decay very rapidly and the compensating integral i sub q that we have introduced can now be evaluated in a closed form as we will now show because we can manipulate that integral i sub q in order to reduce it uh, i will skip some details because they are not but important point is that it can be cast a closed form function a very simple one one half of the square root of pi divided by rho plus a contribution in terms of an additional integral i sub s which can be expressed in terms of the error function or better a scale version of the error function which is the so-called fadeva function w of z defined here in which uh, you have to take into account that the pole could be either captured or not captured and so therefore there will be a discontinuity in this function corresponding to the two cases by putting all the pieces together in the end uh, the compensating integral can be given a compact analytical form in terms of this uh, uh, function uh, f written with a script font which is known in the literature about Zen equations as the attenuation function for historical reason because it was originating from the surf from the study of the uh, so-called ground wave in radio wave propagation so people were interested in evaluating the attenuation of this ground wave produced by some antenna and p is the argument of this attenuation function is the so-called numerical distance again a historical denomination this is nothing but the product of the distance rho the actual distance in meters times the difference between the sommerfeld wave number pole kp and the branch point k1 okay so this is a distance weighted by uh, the difference between the wave numbers of the pole and of the branch point and in turn the attenuation function depending on the sign on the sign of the imaginary part of the sommerfeld pole can be expressed in terms of different uh, uh, combinations involving the fadeva function which means in turn the error function so by collecting these results the final expression for the Stevens descent path integral number one is the one given here in the box involving the the attenuation function f of course this attenuation function is a discontinuous function because when the sign of the imaginary part of the Sommerfeld pole changes this of course when the Sommerfeld pole crosses the Stevens descent path then this function is discontinuous However, its discontinuity is exactly compensated by, by the fact that when the Sommerfeld pole crosses the steepest descent path, then you need to add the residue contribution of the pole that is now captured. So all in all, everything is continuous. So you have a, a discontinuous integral that compensates the discontinuous contribution of the residue. So the sum in the end is continuous as it must be, okay? Uh, I have written this for the integral for the integral i1 that originates from the branch points uh, 
from the branch point k1 because maybe i neglected to do say that before but it was written somewhere written precisely here okay in blue unless the dielectric is very low loss uh, typically the exponential evaluated in correspondence with k2 that is the wave number inside the dielectric is in absolute value much less the, the absolute value of the same exponential evaluated at k1 since k1 could be uh, a real number and in that case the absolute value would be even equal to one so this means that the contribution of the lateral wave that is of the steepest descent path number two that the tours around k2 is typically exponentially small with respect to the contribution of the steepest descent path number one so it can be neglected safely so even though if in principle this lateral wave contribution exists it can be neglected so we have dealt only with the, the other two contributions the steepest descent path number one and the residue at the Sommerfeld pole. And we are close to the end of this story. We can finally asymptotically evaluate the saddle point, uh, the, the steepest descent path integral, which is now in the form of, uh, a, uh, of, a, of the Watson uh, integral, integral from zero to plus infinity of an exponential. And uh, the asymptotic evaluation leads to this kind of expression in which you can see the dependence on rho is uh, like rho to minus 3 over 2. And all the factors here can be evaluated uh, analytically. Those are just constants. Okay. Uh, this as concerns the, um, the regularized integral i sub p, whereas the compensating integral, which involves the, the attenuation function f, can also be evaluated asymptotically. Uh, by skipping the details, the attenuation function possesses an asymptotic expansion in inverse powers of its argument, like the one given here, valid in the limit when the argument is very large in absolute value. And therefore, by collecting together the two results, uh, we get that the contribution from the steepest descent path, number one, can be asymptotically evaluated in this way, where you can see the explicit dependence on rho here and here, but also through the modified attenuation function f, uh, which contains p, the numerical distance, which in turn is proportional to rho. So there is a complex dependence on rho asymptotically. And this kind of expansion, if you truncate things to this order is valid to order rho to minus two in principle we could also go beyond by retaining more terms in the asymptotic series but usually this is enough to get a very accurate representation of the field produced by vertical electric dipole okay i think that's all this was a rather <clears throat> complex tour de force into a, an important historical problem, the, that of Sommerfeld half space, which I have chosen as an application of uh, the techniques for asymptotic evaluation of integrals and also of the residue theorem and the complex analysis we have discussed so far. Um, you can find more details uh, in those see in this series of papers which are beautiful and and beautifully written so if you wish to learn how to write a scientific paper you can write you can read Mikalski and Mosig they are very advisable um, from all, all the points of view from the accuracy of, of the formulas to the way they they cite the literature trying to find exactly who has been the first to derive uh, every result and to reconstruct the, the history of the problem they, they are dealing with. It, they are very similar, those three papers, but they are not exactly equal. So some of them are more compact. Probably the most detailed one is the third one on the Journal of Electromagnetic Waves and Applications. And it's mostly from the this latter paper that I have taken the material for this slide, these slides. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, so 
uh, you will find these slides uh, with some uh, uh, modifications, uh, some typos corrected. Hopefully, in a few hours, uh, I will send them, of course, to Andri and Fabrizio as usual. I don't remember if I sent you the, the PDFs of the last slides, so if you can remind me. Yes, the last. Uh, you, I you have all the last ones. All, okay. yeah. Perfect. Correct. Okay, so that's all for today. So thank you again and see you on Thursday. Bye bye. Ciao. 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 Ciao.